gotten been on the microphone this morning, so I saw it sitting there and went in there in the pew and got to put it on real quick. We do appreciate you being here and certainly encourage you to be back again this evening. Six o'clock, we'll be continuing in a study dealing with second coming, judgment, and beyond tonight. So, we would encourage you to come. And of course, be here on Wednesday evening service as well. We began looking at the fact that God is omniscient a few weeks ago, and this word means all knowing capacity of knowing all things. And we are making a statement that God is omniscient, saying that God has complete knowledge of everything knowable. He's all knowing in that sense. And that certainly we, in our first lesson, we dealt with the scriptures showing that God was omniscient. But then we moved into some practical applications of that omniscience of God that God knows our thoughts, uh, those things that we might not even express. God knows our innermost feelings and our innermost thoughts. God also knows what we say, and thus we need to be careful as to the use of our tongue and how we use our tongue to make sure that we glorify God by what we say. Then we noted that God also knows our actions, both good and bad. He knows whatever we do. Thus, we need to be careful as to what we do and make sure that the actions that we do are in accordance with God's will. And when we noted last week how that God knows our sufferings and sorrows uh, that we endure, that God knows every tear that we shed, that he is also touched by man's sorrow, and that he takes notice of it. This morning we're going to look at two more aspects of God's, of that practical application of God's uh, omniscience. That God knows what we need. And the song that we sang just a moment ago certainly expresses that, that he knows what we need. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 26, uh, he would write, For a God giveth to, to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom, and knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail together and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. He emphasizes here that God gives one thing to one person, something else to someone else, based upon the need that they have. To the man that is good, in God's sight, He gives one thing. To the man who is a sinner, He gives something else. God gives to man what man needs. As our Creator, Genesis first chapter, He created all things. That crowning of creation was creation of man. As the Creator, thus, He knows the needs of His creation. He knows what we're going to need. Even though we might not even realize what we need, God does. And so, let's make some application of that. God knows the physical needs that we have. And thus, he, the, the, David would write, that I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God knows those physical needs that we have for food and shelter and those things. And God provides those who are righteous with those things that they need. In Matthew the 26th, or the, in the 6th chapter, verses 25 through the end of that chapter, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, or nor yet for your body what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, 
If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Look at the world around us and how that God takes care of the world around us through His providence. And He's making the point, don't you realize that God will take care of you? You're more important than the grass of the field, the birds of the air, and all of the things in nature around you. In spite of what some of our people today uh, will claim that nature is all important. No, you're more important than nature. Those, na those things of nature. And God takes care of them, God will take care of you. So God knows those physical needs that we have. And He's going to make sure He's going to take care of He's going to provide for us. But also, God knows that man needs peace. In John the 14th chapter, as Jesus is speaking with His apostles before His ascension back into heaven, or before His crucifixion and ascension back into heaven, He tells them, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Man needs peace. And God is the giver of that peace. Christ said, I'm going to leave peace. It's not the type of peace that the world thinks of. The world thinks of peace as long as there's no active wars going on, no active battle, then we're at peace. And no. Jesus is saying it's not that type of a peace. It's an inner peace where your heart does not have to be afraid. It doesn't have to be troubled. You can have true peace. That's why Paul would write in Philippians 4 and verse 7 that the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here's something that can keep your heart and mind. What is it? You have an inner peace. Your heart is not troubled. It's not afraid. And so, yes, it's a peace that passes, passes all understanding. It is a peace that is with God. And that's a peace that we can have within ourselves. Because we have peace with God, we can have that inner tranquility of mind. Even though there might be troubles and difficulties all around us, even though there might be wars and fightings all around us, yet we can be at peace one with another, with within ourselves. True peace. Then, he knows that we need joy. Philippians, the first chapter, or the third chapter, in verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And then he repeats it in chapter 4 and verse 4 Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Here's true joy and peace that we can have in Christ. And notice, rejoice in the Lord. Both of these verses here shows us where we have rejoicing. Where true joy is. This is not a, a happiness that is affected by simply the outward circumstances of life. That's basically what the world in general seeks after. That if I can only have this thing, if I can only get this amount of money, if I can only get that job advancement, if I can only... And it's all dealing with the circumstances of life. And they think, if I can have that, then I'll be happy. But this isn't affected by the outward circumstances of life. This is a joy that comes from inside. It is a joy that is a result of our being at one with God and having our sins washed away and the hope that we have of an eternity with God. And thus we can, as Paul would tell the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16, we joy seven more. We have true joy as given through Jesus Christ. But also... God recognizes man's need for a purpose in life. 
that man has some a purpose and needs a purpose there's something that is there within his life that he needs he needs some object that he can set on and this is becomes his goal well, God has given us that in keeping his commandments being obedient to him as Solomon learned in Ecclesiastes and while we read from Ecclesiastes earlier and he says these things are vanity his conclusion on everything within this world is that it's vanity and vexation of spirit and he concludes here's the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole of man this is man's purpose. This is man's duty. This is the entirety of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. God gives us a purpose in life. That purpose is, yes, to fear God and keep His commandments. And the fear of God would certainly involve being afraid of God from the standpoint of realizing what God can do. Jesus would tell us Matthew, the 10th chapter, Fear not him that is able to, uh, to kill the body, but is not able to destroy the soul, but rather fear him that is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We are to fear him in that sense. But here it's dealing more with a reverence and a respect of God that will cause us to live in obedience to his will. We fear God. We have such reverence for God. We realize his greatness and, yes, his omniscience. And it leads us to, I'm going to do what He says. I'm going to keep His commandments no matter what those commandments are, no matter what it might cost. My goal in life, my purpose in life is to glorify God within my life. In Acts the 17th chapter, Paul is dealing with these Athenians and he's telling them, he's revealing them to them that one God, the true God, as opposed to all of the idols that they had. And he says that God has made of one blood all nations of the earth for to dwell on the face of the earth. And then he says in verse 27 that they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. Here is our purpose. Here is our goal in life. Not to make a lot of money. Not to become wise in the world's eyes. Not to have a whole bunch of things. You've seen uh, the bumper sticker and sometimes the statement, man with the most toys wins. That's the thinking of the world. As long as you can get the most toys, as long as you can have the biggest house or the finest house, the most elaborate things within the house, the biggest car, and on and on it goes. As long as you can get that, then that's true purpose in life. That's what they seek after. But Paul is saying, oh no, that's not what man is to seek after. That's not man's goal or purpose. Man was placed upon this earth that they should seek God. That they should live that type of life and lifestyle that would be pleasing unto Him. That would glorify our God through our lives. That's man's purpose and goal. That's why when he does this and when he's accomplishing this within his life, he's truly living as God wants him to live. He's fearing God and keeping His commandments. That's why he can have joy. That's why he can have peace within his life. Why? Because it's joyous truly, to have a true purpose in life that accomplishes something that is of value. And so, yes, here's a purpose in life that leads to that joy and that peace that we talked about. But also God realizes, well... 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. I'll mention that one as well. For ye are bought with price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. That's man's purpose. Glorify God in your body. But man also needs security within life. We do need security. When we feel insecure, that just it, it's a horrible feeling. It brings fearfulness to one's life. 
man needs security. That's why we lock our houses at night so that we can feel secure and we can go to bed not having to worry and be afraid. Man needs security. Well, God gives that security. Romans 8 and verse 31. Who can say, or what can we say then, or shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You want a real security? Here it is. You live according to God's will, and then it, God will be for you. But if God's for you, who in the world can defeat God? God is that um, all-powerful being. And we have previously looked at the omnipotence of God and how that He truly is an all-powerful being. Well, if He's for us, that one who is able to create this world with His spoken word, who sustains this world, if God is for us, who in the world can be against us? No one can. In Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 5 and verse 6, we're told, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. What can man do unto me if God's on my side? That's why Jesus would say, and as we quoted a moment ago from Matthew 10 and verse 28, don't fear that individual who's only able to kill the body. He can't do anything to your soul. Rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the one you're to fear. But what about man? What can he do to you? If God is my helper, what is man going to accomplish? You know, if we have that true purpose in life of praising God and thus having heaven as our home, what, what if man comes along and puts us to death? Well, Paul would say and take care of that for us when he would state in, Matthew, in Philippians the first chapter, to die is gain. Now he said just before that, to live is Christ. So as long as I'm living for Christ... Death is gain to me. You've just helped me accomplish my goal. What can you do to me? Nothing you can do. If you turn over to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, Paul is, discusses what he says is our light affliction. Light affliction. And yet, if you look at the 11th chapter and look at all that he went through, the sufferings, uh, the persecutions, the shipwrecks, the being stoned, being beaten, and all of these other things that he mentions, and he said, our light affliction? Why? He says, number one, it's but for a moment. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. And it works for us a far more exceeding, exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from, the, from heaven. What is it here in this world? If they persecute us, if they do all of the bring us suffering, the Lord's my helper. I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. Our light affliction, yes, this is light in view of eternity. This is nothing then. We go through a few years here of suffering and of persecution even. What is that in relationship to eternity? The eternity of joy with God in heaven. And even here in this life, even that persecution and suffering that we endure, we know that God is with us. And He's given us that purpose and intent. He's given us the security that we need to know that yes, there's an eternity with Him in heaven awaiting us. 
so I can have joy and I can have peace in my life, even in spite of those persecutions. There's true security that the Christian has. What does that person in the world have? He has absolutely nothing. He's lost and undone. He has no security. What's he got to look forward to? Dying. Death. And then all of these things that he sought after, who shall those things be then? Won't be his, because he won't be able to take them with him. The only way that we can take anything out of this life is to send it on before us by living the Christian life. By setting our affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Seeking those things that are above where Christ said it at the right hand of God. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. So let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content in such things as you have. Why? Because God is our security. God will never leave, forsake us. He will help us. So it doesn't matter what man might do. Man needs security. God has provided it for us. But God also knows that man needs salvation. Man is lost because of sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul would write in Romans 3 and verse 23. In chapter 6, he would again emphasize that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But those wages of sin is death. Man is lost. Man is separated from God because of sin. When Adam and Eve ate that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it separated between them and God. There was no longer a fellowship that was there. And man needed salvation. Man needed a way in which to alleviate his sin. And all men now, when they come to that age of accountability, that time in which they know to choose the good and eschew evil, they commit sin within their life. And they separate themselves from God. Man's lost because of sin. God, though, identified the problem. He identified the problem of sin and knew about the problem of sin. And He provided man with the only solution that there is that's possible. Notice in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy with His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Now there's our condition. We are dead in sins. There's the problem. God, though, because of His great, His rich being rich in mercy and because of the love that He loved us, identified that problem of sin. And what does He do? hath made us alive. That's the word quickened is to be made alive. Hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. What is it? God provided the solution. And that solution is Christ. And hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages of to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, and two good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. There is that problem of sin. You were dead in trespasses and sins, each one of us that have reached that age of accountability, have become dead in trespasses and sins. God, who's rich in mercy, provided the solution, though, through Christ Jesus. Because of His, great, His grace and His kindness toward us, He provided us that salvation in Christ Jesus. And so, yes, it cost the blood of, his, of the only begotten Son of God to provide for us that salvation which is needed. In Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 9, Paul would write, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. What is it here is the grace of God in identifying the problem of sin and then providing the solution that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Christ died for each one of us. God providing the solution. In 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We cannot be redeemed with all of the money that this world might have to offer. Can, cannot redeem anyone. Cannot bring us back to God. The only way that that can be accomplished is with the precious blood of Christ. And thus, He was offered as our sin offering, a sacrifice, so that we could have our sins taken away and removed by His blood. And thus, we need to have an obedient faith in order to take away that sin problem. God has provided the solution in Christ, but it takes faith in Him and faith in Christ in order to have that forgiveness. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, We're told, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That faith comes by the Word of God, we're told in Romans 10 and verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so God has provided for us by His grace that which instructs us and teaches us so that we can have that sin problem alleviated. Then we must repent of our sins. Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He repeats that in verse 5. Same thing, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What we need to repent. Man needs to confess Christ's name. And Jesus would say, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. We've got to confess Christ. That He is the Son of God. And then, we must be baptized to wash away our sins. Acts 22 and verse 16, Why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. God identified the problem. Here's sin. He provided man the solution to that sin problem. It's Jesus Christ. And through our obedient faith that will cause us to repent, confess, be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins or wash away our sins, we can alleviate that sin problem. Paul sets forth very beautifully for us in Romans 3rd chapter. When he starts in verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice there is the grace of God. God is providing that problem-solving nature of Jesus Christ. We can have redemption through Jesus Christ that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has sent to, for it to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness that He may be, might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Yes, God can be just. That is, his, He is a righteous God. His justice demands the punishment of sin. And so when man sins, there's that problem of sin. There's the need, there's the necessity, there's the absolute must that God punish the sin. He is just but He's also the justifier of them that believe in Christ because He sent forth Christ to be the redemption and the propitiation to take that punishment for us. The punishment that you and I deserve because of the sins that we commit, they're placed upon Christ. 
and he died for us he suffered the death penalty for us and so god can be just he's punished sin but he's also the justifier he declares us as not guilty and thus can have that home with god in heaven yes god knows our needs but then one last point this morning god knows right from wrong he in this sense defines morality man oftentimes tries to set himself up as the standard the humanist manifesto and i realize it was written several years ago a few decades ago in reality but yet it set forth the ideas that man that man was going to live by and that many live by today but in that humanist manifesto the first one and then now the second one i wanted to quote a couple of statements that it has in manifesto 2 and they write as non-theists we begin with humans not god nature not deity you see what they're doing is they're already setting up themselves as the standard we're beginning with man not god god's not the standard man is and so they would write promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusion, illusionary and harmful. I'm talking about heaven or hell and having that expectation is harmful. In spite of the fact that that's where we get true peace and security and joy. No, those things, that's illusionary. That's harmful for you. But then when it comes to morality, they write, we affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics is both autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. Ethics stem from human need and interest. They've set themselves up as a standard. Ethic, that is a standard of right and wrong, is determined by man. Not by some thought of God or what God might say or some ideological sanction that God might give. We're the standard for what is right and what is wrong. Ethics stem from human need and interest. We don't have time to get into the problems of this statement that ethics is autonomous and situational. They contradict each other. If ethics is autonomous, then it's not situational. If it's situational, it's not autonomous. But that's another whole lesson. But they've set man as the standard of what is right and wrong. Solomon would say, though, that there is a way that seemeth right in a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Same is true with those who would sign that, human, that signed that humanist manifesto. They had a way that they thought was right, but in reality it was the way of death. Jeremiah would write in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man is trying to direct his own way, trying to set forth a, a standard. Ethics is situational and autonomous. Forget about God. Forget about what God says. It's not defined by ideological or theological sanctions. No, forget that. It's all about man. Man sets forth his own standard. Yet man doesn't know how to walk. Man doesn't know how to direct his own steps. You want proof of that, all you have to do is go down the streets, some of the streets of our town, or any larger town nowadays, and see these young kids that are, have absolutely no God and no thought of God and the lifestyle that they live. And we talk about that and the problem of it. The problem is they were taught humanism. They grew up believing it. 
They were force fed it from the time in which they were in kindergarten all the way through the schooling. You're nothing but an animal. A glorified animal, yes, but you're an animal. You evolved from monkeys. And they taught that year after year, class after class, and they left God out of the picture. And so they became a law unto themselves. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man, very simply, doesn't have the wisdom to direct his own way. Isaiah would write in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, For God, that my ways are not your my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The creator of the world, the creator of man, knows right and wrong. He has the wisdom to determine what is right and what is wrong. In 1 Corinthians, the first and second chapter, really, Paul is dealing with the wisdom of man as opposed to the wisdom of God. And he's showing that the wisdom of God is foolishness with man, but even the greatest wisdom of man cannot even compare with the foolishness of God. He says in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, Verses 19 and 20, as it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And yet man comes along and says, all oh, the wisdom of this world, that's it. That's what's going to direct our steps? No. Verse 25 will add, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man. God knows how to set forth that which is right and that which is wrong. He sets the standard. He has set that standard within God's will, the Bible. In 1 Samuel 2 and verse 3, tells him to talk no more so exceedingly proudly let not your arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Notice how he ties in the omniscience of God with our actions being weighed. That God knows how to weigh our actions. God knows what is right from what is wrong. He is the one who sets that standard. And thus, we need to accept what He says regarding our life, regarding what is right and what is wrong, because He is all-wise, He is all-knowing. Truly a God that we can respect and that we need to reverence. And we need to live after and we need to live our lives to glorify Him that should be our whole purpose in life. And we glorify Him by living according to that which is right as set forth within the pages of the New Testament. And we abstain from those things that He has not authorized, those things that He shows us are wrong within life. Why? Because He's the one who sets that standard. He knows what is good for a man and what is bad for man. He knows right from wrong. Now, if you've not become a Christian and had your sins washed away and not taken a, a veil of yourself, not availed yourself of that opportunity to have your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, God has provided for you a Savior. He's provided for you the salvation of your sins. Why not in humble obedience to His will respond in faithfulness to Him? to do those things that we enumerated just a moment ago. And then live according to that which is right is set forth within the pages of the Bible. If you need to come back into Him because you have become a child of God, but you haven't continued to live according to that standard of, of God that God has set of what is right, why not come back into Him? Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. Loving Heavenly Father stands and will run to meet you to forgive you of your sins if you will become.
need to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.